Good? Ah, okay. I muted myself. It was my fault. So, hey, welcome to CCW. You've been with us for the last 11 months. We've been going through this year-long study called Core 52, where we are looking at 52 core ideas from the Bible, big ideas from the Bible. Um, now, we've been breaking it down into smaller bite-sized series. We're starting a new one today called One Thing, One Thing. And we're going to be looking at the Apostle Paul and his writings, and we're going to be looking at what he says about one singular truth that can utterly change our lives when we come to understand it. But before we get to Paul, I have a little activity that we're going to do together. As you can see, I have two baskets up here. We've got the bad basket, and we've got the good basket. Now, in this bag are some ping pong balls. Each one has the name of somebody on it, either someone currently living, someone from history, or even a fictional character. And you're going to help me out by categorizing these names, these people, into the, either the good or bad baskets. Now, I have no idea the names that are in this bag, to be honest. I had Jeff and Brody fill them out. So Brody's telling me there's still some good stuff in here. So let's do this. Here we go. Here's the first one. This, I don't know how you're going to sort this one. Picasso. Picasso. Where does he go? Good, bad. He, I don't have an in-between. I don't have an in-between. I, dude, I just, I, I, I can't get into his art. Sorry. I, I don't like it. Okay. All right. Here we go. Next one. Ooh, Tom Brady. Oh, wow. Uh, who would have thought that this would cause some issues, right? <laughs> who would have thought? What do you think, Jeff? Where does Tom Brady go? Uh, he doesn't even want to answer it. He doesn't want to answer this question. It, okay, for the sake of Tampa Bay, there we go. We'll, we'll throw him in there. Okay, uh, we got Robin Hood. Listen, he was a thief, but he stole from the rich to give to the poor. So where do we put him, good or bad? Bad? Okay. Thieves winning out today, Robin Hood. Okay. James Bond. Dun, 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 dun. I don't know. He kills a lot of people in Her Majesty's Secret Service. No? He's good? Oh, I don't know. But which James Bond? The Daniel Craig or... <laughs> Pierce Brosnan. Okay. Pierce Brosnan. Daniel Craig's a little questionable. Okay. Here's an easy one for you. We've got Adolf Hitler. Mm. There we go. Adolf, right where you belong. Okay. Uh, Steve from Blue's Clues. You know this? Blue's Clues? You can't be upset, this dude. Come on, he was so nice. He was so nice. He even made a video recently telling you that you're a great person and your life's worthwhile. Okay, uh, we got Shrek, the ogre. Good? Okay, he's the reluctant good type, though, right? You know, he, he pretends he's bad. Some of you guys are like that. You motorcyclists out there, you pretend you're bad, but you're soft, he's inside. Okay, uh, oh. Joe Caputo. <laughs> Seriously, and, and I can say this, Joe is one of the nicest guys I've ever met. Can we all agree with that? He's, he's awesome. He's awesome. Joe's good. Joe's good. Okay, we've got Thanos for you Marvel fans out there. But listen, he was doing the galaxy a favor, right? He was, he was kind of taking out half of the galaxy. That was, no, no? Okay, fine. All right, and finally we have Indiana Jones. Oh, okay. I like Indy. He's fun. What do you think? Good or bad? Good. Okay, archaeologist in the good basket. All right, so now that you have come to church this morning and learned how to be a horrible person by judging everybody, <laughs> now, um, how we determine? How we determine where these people are going to end up? Why the good basket versus the bad basket? Now. I've got a word, we don't use it too often. This word is merit, merit. And merit is this idea of deserving value or worth based off of what you've done in life, right? Merit. And so what we're really asking is, what did these people do to merit the title good? 
And what did those people do to end up over there? Now, this answer is rather complicated because it sometimes has to do with the actions that they took, the way that history looks at them, the reputations that they've earned over the course of their life, whether they've showed love or failed to show love, I mean, or just bad art, right? You know what I mean? Like, there's all different kinds of reasons that we categorize people like this, but my point in bringing all this up is just to point out that we as human beings have this tendency to categorize people based on an internal merit system. And that marriage system might look different depending on your age or your culture or your, your personal history. Um, all kinds of things can shape that, but ultimately, all of us do this. We all do this. We all determine moral worth, good or bad, depending on people's actions, what they have done in their life. And this isn't any big surprise, guys, because we live in a culture where merit is how we figure things out. So, for instance, you were probably in school at one point, and you merited a grade based on your academic excellence, right? How many of you competed in a sport at some point? Anybody? All right. I was in the sport, like I played soccer, and we were the team that won one time the entire season, and it's only because the other team didn't show up. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, some of you, though, merited trophies because you were good at what you did, or your team was good, or maybe, Maybe you've gotten a job or a promotion, and that might have been based off of merit. You determined, you were, you were determined valuable by your actions, right? We live in a culture where merit is all over the place. It's how we do things. So it's no surprise that merit is how we judge people morally as well. The problem is that there is no merit in God's categorization, right? He, this isn't how he categorizes people as good or bad, we don't merit the good side of things, the title good in his world. So, we're gonna look at something today, a one thing that can utterly change our estimation of other people, our estimation of ourselves, our estimation of God and of this world. And when we understand this one thing, well, we can be different people, all right? One thing from the Apostle Paul. And so, this idea has a name, it's, it's called grace. You've heard this word before, right? Grace, grace. So you may have heard it in the context of the most famous hymn of all time, right? Amazing grace. <laughs> Taylor's just like ugh, 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 dying inside over here. This is why the worship team does not let me on stage. So, uh, or maybe you were sitting around a Thanksgiving meal at one point and someone said, oh, could you say, Grace, or, or maybe you heard someone described as graceful, right, a dancer or something. We use this word in all different kinds of contexts inside of our culture, so if we're going to understand what the Bible has to say about it, we've got to get on the same page, same definition. So here is the word from the Bible. The, the Greek word is charis. That's a, that's a pretty word, right? So say it with me, charis. And charis means being given or shown favor, especially by someone in a position to exercise goodwill by meeting a particular need that's mouthful. I actually like the second definition better. It says a free and or unmerited gift, a gift that we do not deserve. And that's what grace means inside of the Bible. In the Bible, grace means the gift of God, mercy, forgiveness, love, goodness that he pours out on us, this gift that we do not deserve. Deserve. Now, you're going to find this word used approximately 170 times inside of the New Testament, but a full two-thirds of those instances are by the Apostle Paul. He liked talking about grace. He talked about grace a whole lot. But why is that? Why was grace such a big deal for him? Well, I think it's because Paul understood his great need for grace, and that's why he talked about it so much. See, if you know Paul's story, when we first meet him in the book of Acts, his name's not Paul, right? It's Saul of Tarsus. And Saul of Tarsus was, well, he had a rough start. In fact, the, the first spot that we meet him, he's standing holding the coats of a group of people who are stoning to death a follower of Christ named Stephen, the first Christian martyr. And it says that Saul looked on Stephen's death with approval. Not the nicest thing in the world, right? And then later on, 
we find him going from city to city and arresting Christians and confiscating their property and even having them killed. Saul was a Christian slayer, and that all changed when he encountered the risen Jesus Christ. On the road to Damascus, he, he encounters Jesus in a vision, and, and, this, and this changes Saul forever. He becomes a Christ follower. The very, the very person that he was persecuting, he is now following. And his name changes too, right? He goes from Saul to Paul, which is the Greek version of his name. And he becomes a missionary. He starts going out and he goes to all these different places throughout the Roman Empire and he plants churches. And he teaches them what it means to follow Christ. Uh, Paul is beaten, he's shipwrecked, he's arrested. Eventually he's even beheaded because of his faith in Jesus Christ. Everything changed for him, right? And now we would look back and we say, man, Paul is kind of like a super Christian, right? He's, I mean, his letters, his letters, we've got like a bunch of them inside of the Bible. 2,000 years later, God saw fit to make sure that we had these letters written by Paul. He, he was going all over the place. He died for his faith. That's, I mean, that's pretty impressive, right? But check out how Paul describes himself. First Timothy, he's writing a letter to one of his protégés, a guy by the name of Timothy, and he says, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Paul, the super-Christian, the missionary, the man who would go, to die, go on to die for his faith, described himself as the worst of all sinners. Now listen, he had experienced God's forgiveness. He had experienced God's grace and mercy, he was living a, this new life, but he still recognized that he didn't deserve it, right? He was irredeemable apart from Jesus Christ. He could not be good enough. He couldn't earn it. And so that is why he spends so much time talking about this idea of grace, because he was in such need of the grace that was extended to him. So we're going to take a deeper dive into some of what Paul has to say about grace through one of his letters, the letter to the Ephesians chapter 2. Now, here's the deal. I did not put this on the screen today on purpose because I want you to open your Bibles. You got to learn how to navigate at some point, right? Or pull out your phones. I'm okay with that too. Ephesians chapter 2. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you out. If you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles in the seat in front of you. Use it. Take it with you. You can have it. We would love for you to have God's word in hand. Now, to find Ephesians, you're going to flip over to the latter third of your Bible. This is what we call the New Testament. It, if you start at the beginning of the New Testament, you get four different perspectives on the life of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Then you get to the, the, um, the history of the early church in Acts. And then you get to these letters. And there's a couple of longer letters Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and then you get to these short little guys, Galatians, Ephesians. So it's kind of tough to find in there because it's right in the middle of all these bigger things, and it's only a couple of pages. So if you're still not able to find this, that's okay. Check it out. God made it easy for us. Here's a list of all the books. You're going to look for it down here. You can turn to the page. Chapter 2, that's the big number 2, and we're going to read from there. While you're getting that already, let me tell you a little bit about this letter. See, Paul, during his missionary journeys, has spent time in the city of Ephesus. And Ephesus was located in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. And he had helped plant this church in Ephesus, and he had spent several years there helping it to grow and to thrive. But this is now years later down the road. Paul has moved on from Ephesus, and he's now imprisoned. And he's writing to these churches that he had been part of along the way. And he writes to the Ephesians, and he spends the first three chapters of this tiny letter explaining the idea of the gospel all over again, the good news about Jesus Christ. In the last three chapters, chapters 4, 5, and 6, he talks about how that gospel, that good news, should go on to shape our lives as Christ followers. So in chapter 1, we get a greeting. Paul says, hi, guys. And then he goes on, and he reminds them of what this gospel is all about, the good things that they had received through Jesus Christ. But then he focuses on the heart of the gospel, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's where we find ourselves in, at the beginning of chapter 2. Here's what he says. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world 
and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us who lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. All right, so Paul is answering a very important question here. Why do we need grace? And his answer is this, is uh, you were spiritually dead, right? You were dead. Why were you dead? Because you were following the ways of this world, following the king, the ruler of this earth. And he's talking about uh, the adversary of everything good, the enemy of all goodness, the enemy of God. We call him sometimes Satan or the devil here. But those are just titles. In fact, Satan means adversary, right? So he's the adversary of all the good, and it says that he's the ruler of the kingdom of the air. That's just talking about this earth. And this is where he gets to cause chaos and havoc and rule. And we, at one time, were following him. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, I've never been a Satan worshiper, right? I mean, well, some of you may have. I, I don't know. But uh, probably the majority of you weren't in some weird cult where you were sacrificing small children or anything like that. And yet, Paul says that by our actions, by the choices that we have made along the way, we have shown who our true, true Lord is. And the true Lord is the adversary. Because we all bring sin and brokenness into the world. We do things that are unloving towards other people. These are the things that, that the adversary would have us do. And so he says, previous to being in Christ, you used to live out your life selfishly. It was all about you and about what you wanted, and you satisfied those desires in you. And what's the result? Well, you're deserving of the wrath of God. You're deserving of the wrath of God. So here's what Paul is saying. He is saying that every single one of us is deserving of the wrath of God. And he doesn't leave any way out of this. Every single one of us. You cannot be good enough. You cannot work hard enough. You cannot adopt enough orphans. You can't help enough old ladies across the street. Mother Teresa, Indiana Jones... Even Tom Brady, yes. All of us end up over here in terms of God's categorization. We all are in the bad basket by our actions. Okay? You get that? So this is why we're in need of grace. And so Paul, he goes on in verse 4, and he says this, but because of his great love for us, and let's pause there because this is really important, but, right, but, we deserved wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. But because of the love of God, even though we deserve wrath, we are extended grace in Jesus Christ. And where does this grace show up? Does it, does it show up when, um, when we read through the entire Bible or when we show up to church enough times or when we say enough Hail Marys? Is that, is that where grace shows up? No, it, it shows up in the midst of our brokenness. It shows up in the midst of our, our spiritual death and the worst moments in our life. This is where grace shows up, right? And he says there is something that happens as a result of this grace in us. Here's what it is. He says, and God raised us up in Christ Jesus and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us through Christ Jesus. So as a result of the grace of God, we get to be raised up with Jesus, resurrected. We get to experience all the, the goodness and mercy and overflowing love of God through Christ Jesus. That's some good stuff, right? Like, th those are some great rewards to this. Now, you got to understand this, this idea of resurrection, raised up. This active in the Greek, that means that it's already started. It's already begun. We are being resurrected. When we choose to surrender to Jesus Christ and are baptized into his name, it says that resurrection begins in us. Now, obviously, we're all going to die. This is just uh, part of being human right now. We're going to die, and then it says that ultimately we will experience full resurrection on the other side of that when Jesus Christ returns, a new life, a new earth, a new creation. Good stuff. Like, this is, this is great. We are the beginning of the resurrection. Awesome. So how do we earn this? 
How do we merit this grace that God is extending to us? We can't. We cannot. You and I, we don't earn grace. We don't merit grace. Remember, we're in the the bad basket, right? But, here again, Paul is going to go on. Uh, He says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not by works, so that no man can boast. See, this grace, it's extended through Jesus Christ. Not to, not because of the actions that we've taken, not by the works that we've done. Why? Because God doesn't want us boasting. Boasting is when we place confidence in our own ability to solve our problems. And the truth is that we cannot solve this problem. We cannot, through our own ability, save ourselves. So it's not by works, it's by grace and faith in what Jesus Christ has done. Now, faith in the Bible is a complicated thing. It's not just believing that Jesus is Lord. It's, it's also living in loyalty to him. So when the Bible goes on and talks about faith at other points, and this is Paul's writing, he talks about this idea of confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of repenting of our old way of life. That means putting off all the old habits, the old choices that we made when we were people of the world, and choosing to follow Christ into something new, living like Jesus in this world, and being baptized into his name for the Holy Spirit. This is, this is what's meant by faith in the Bible. And so faith in Christ is the beginning of grace, right? That's where everything starts for us. This is where grace begins. And this is amazing, guys, right? You know, this is, this is amazing because um, we don't deserve it, right? That's the whole idea behind grace. We cannot earn it. Grace is at the beginning of the freedom from wrath and death and destruction that we deserve. It's there with us, sustaining us all the way. And guess what? Grace is there when we fail along the way to make uh, our loyalty to Jesus complete because every single one of us is messed up, right? And we will continue to mess up even after we know Jesus Christ. Grace is there. Grace is there. And this is why Paul is so adamant about talking about grace. This is why I like talking about grace. I'll tell you what, I didn't always. Um, Just out of curiosity, how many of you have been here for 11 plus years? 11 plus years. Okay, so you know some of my story. I want to share my story with the rest of you today just because um, it's really a story about grace and works. See, I, I've been here for 36 years at CCW, born. Next week, my parents brought me here. I've been here ever since. I could probably build a room somewhere in the building, and it would be considered appropriate at this point. Um, but I grew up in this community. At the age of nine, I was baptized into Christ Jesus. I recognized, in my head at least, that this was the right thing to do. And then throughout the next few years, I worked real hard. I taught and I volunteered. Um, In fact, Jeff can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I would actually consider myself at that time probably the golden child of the church community, okay? (laughs) Am am I okay saying that? Or is that like, uh, he's saying no, okay. Um, Anyway, I was at least up there. Um, My... I, I, uh, by eighth grade, I was actually in charge of the third and fourth graders and taught their entire class through high school. I continued teaching and being involved. And um, in middle school, I recognized, hey, I'm, I'm headed towards ministry. That's what God has designed me for. And so I went off to college at Florida Christian College, and I spent four years getting a degree, and I came out uh, with great grades, okay, great grades. Not only that, I was the class orator. So um, after I spoke at the graduation, I had three different job offers that night. I don't know if you knew that. That It was pretty exciting. I still decided to come back here because I love you guys. Um, And I was hired on as the middle school minister here. And half a year later, I became the full-time youth minister. Jeff moved from being the youth minister to the family minister, okay? So everything's going great. I look great. I'm working really, really hard, and I'm not relying on grace at all. Okay? Everything I'm doing is because I'm just working and working and working. I'm being such a good person Like, I believe in my head that I can get into heaven, right? 
And the truth was that things were getting worse and worse. And every time I ran into a problem, instead of relying on God, I chose to rely on myself instead. And uh, 2010 rolls around, and I describe this as the worst and best year of my life. By this point, I'm uh, addicted to pornography. I am uh, dealing with anxiety in such a great way because fear has just taken hold in my life. It's rooted in me deeply. And in 2010, I uh, fell in love with the preschool director that was here at the time. And the only problem was she was married. Uh, She was going through a separation at the time, and we ended up having an affair. And um, I remember her coming to me in May of that year and saying, Josh, I'm pregnant. And at that moment, my world kind of came crashing down. All this work that I had done all along the way, it was now for not, it was for nothing. Um, In fact, I'd like to say at this point that suddenly everything changed and I started relying on God, but my first thoughts when Jeanette came to me were, oh my gosh, I need to sell everything I have, liquidate it, and get as far away from here as possible. Start a new life somewhere else, right? But we decided instead to go and talk to our family members. And over the course of the next couple days, we had conversations with family members, with uh, coworkers who are like family members. We had conversations with with people who uh, were volunteering alongside of us, friends, and they, every single one was a difficult conversation, guys. Every single one. And through the midst of this, I saw the life that I had built for myself crashing down around me. And I asked, the elders, I said, hey, can we, on Sunday morning, can, can we get up and apologize to the community? I knew I was resigning from my position, and I knew I couldn't talk to every single one of you along the way, and so I remember standing at this po- podium in 2010 and just sharing the brokenness that I had caused inside of this community, the brokenness that I had caused inside of God's kingdom, and, and just, uh, man, I was... I was just a complete and utter mess. That was my rock bottom. And I'm standing here on stage, and I'm crying my eyes out as I'm explaining this to everybody. And a guy in the audience stands up, uh, Ray Flores, and he shouts out, Josh, I forgive you. And I'll tell you what. I had known all about grace my entire life. But that day in the church, I got to experience grace for the first time. When I got off the stage, I had a line of people who came and prayed with me and hugged me and forgave me. And and listen, there were consequences. There were all kinds of consequences by my actions. I'm not saying like I got off scot-free. No, it was a mess. I lost this job that I thought I'd been designed for all my entire life. I didn't know what I was going to do next. Instead, I had to carry four jobs as I supported a new family. That December, Jeanette and I got married, and I became the father of three. I wasn't ready for that. I was not ready for that. And in the midst of all this, I developed a panic disorder. There were consequences to the sin and brokenness that I brought into this world. Um, And it took years and years of healing on my part, years of healing and the relationships that I have with people in this community. But by God's grace, I get to stand before you today and tell you that being the golden child, having it all together, putting on a good facade, being good enough, doesn't work. It doesn't work. According to what we heard today, Every single one of us, you, me, Paul, we all end up here. And we're just fooling ourselves if we think that we can do this without the grace of God. So in spite of all the consequences, God showed up again and again and again over those coming years. People loved on us. People continued to allow us to be a part of this community. God just it was amazing in the midst of this. In spite of the brokenness I brought into the world, God was able to redeem what I had done and use it for good. That's the God we serve. And quite honestly, guys, I want you to experience grace to the same degree that I have. 
I'd love for you to miss out on the soul-crushing humiliation and uh, all the other bad stuff that went along with it. But even if that's what it takes, even if it takes rock bottom for you, I pray and hope that you will experience this grace that God has extended to you. Now, we got to pause for a moment because I find that when people encounter grace, they respond in one of five ways. I'm going to share these with you real briefly, these five ways, but the first four, I'm just going to tell you right off the bat, from what we see in the writings of Paul, they don't work. This isn't how we're supposed to respond to grace, but most of us find ourselves in this trap at some point or another. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to introduce you to them real quick. I'm going to give you some teachings of Paul elsewhere, because like I said, Paul loved talking about grace, so I'm just going to point you to some passages in the Bible that talk about this. So here we go. You ready? The first thing is some people, when they encounter grace, they try to deny it. All right? They try to uh, act like they don't need it. Some people, it's because they just they don't believe in God. They don't believe that he's real, so why would they be in need of his grace? Some people are angry with God. They think that God's wronged them in some way, so they don't want his grace. Some people just recognize they want to do their own thing. They want to be Lord of their life, and they don't want God lording it over them, so they j- deny his grace grace. And guys, I do not have enough time right now to convince you that God is real, but he is. I don't have enough time to tell you that you and I are deserving of wrath and and really help you understand that, but we are. I can't convince you right now that heaven and eternity are real things, but it, it is, guys. These are, these are real things. And so in the book of Romans, chapter 1, Paul writes and he, he tells the Romans, hey, here is the consequence of living lives our own way. And so I encourage you, if you are in this place where you're denying your need for the grace of God, check this out. Now, you might try to deny it, but you might try to earn it, like me. And if you heard anything today, I hope you understand, you can't. You can't. In fact, when we live in this state of trying to earn God's grace, it's just because we're control freaks. You know what I mean? Some of you guys out there are control freaks. You want to hold on to it. You want to be the determiner of your own destiny, and you want to work real hard. you got to cut it out, all right? Because Paul, he writes in Philippians, and he shares how he was the golden child of Judaism, He said, hey, I had it all together. I did all the right things. But when I encountered Christ, all of that was meaningless, garbage, useless. We cannot earn God's grace. There's some of you who aren't denying it, you aren't earning it, but you might be abusing it. And we've all been here at some point or another. Every single one of us has made a conscious decision when we come to Christ to choose to walk outside of his will for our life at some point or another, right? We've been sitting there and thinking, and you, and you know, you're like, I know God doesn't want me to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to choose not to act like Christ. And listen, it's going to happen, and thank God for grace, right? But some of us live in this state where we just keep turning to God and doing things our own way repetitively, repetitively, over and over and over again, just relying on his forgiveness. And eventually this desensitizes you to what God truly wants to do in your life. And he calls us, in the Bible, he calls us to holiness. He calls us to righteousness, to right living. We just got to understand that those things, they don't save us. They're in response to the grace that we've experienced. See, when we experience grace, Paul says that true grace will not leave us unchanged right? We can't go on living the same way anymore if we have experienced God's grace. So in Galatians 5, he talks about two ways of life, a way of life where we continue doing things our own way and we produce fruit of sin and a way of life in which we start doing things in God's way and we produce through the Spirit spiritual fruit. And go and check that out. And, and finally, you might try to not abuse it, but maybe, maybe you doubt it. Maybe you doubt that God can pierce into the midst of the mess you've made, the darkness that you have in your own life. Maybe you think that God is so far away. He could never love someone like you. Once again, I hope you heard today, you don't deserve God's love. None of us do. None, not a single one of us do. But he extends it to us anyway. He loves us 
in such a huge way. In fact, in Romans chapter 8, Paul talks about this idea of how God's, God's love is just overwhelming, how it surpasses every barrier, that nothing can stand in its way. And so check that out. Another great one is Luke 15. In fact, if you're going through the Core 52 stuff with us this week, Luke 15 has three stories that Jesus tells. He tells a story about a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. And the point of all these stories is just how big God's love is for us, how he would go across any bounds to, to make sure that we get to experience that love. So stop doubting it. God loves you, and he wants to extend his grace to you. So we can't deny it. We can't earn it. We can't choose to continue abusing it or trying, doubting it all along the way. So what's left? Grace is left, right? Embracing, embracing God's grace with all that we are, surrendering to this overflow of grace in our lives. That's what we've got to do, guys. We've got to embrace it for what it is. And that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And so if this is the first time that you've heard about this grace thing, or if you recognize that you're in need of God's grace, I'm going to ask you, please, today, don't leave before you have a conversation with someone about it. We're going to have a prayer team up here in a few minutes. I'm going to be hanging out in the hallway. Please come talk to one of us about what it means to place faith in Jesus Christ. We would love to pray with you. We would love to have this conversation with you. Now, for the rest of us, those are, who are currently walking inside the grace of God, who have experienced the forgiveness that comes through Jesus Christ, there's still one verse left that we've got to read from Ephesians. This is Ephesians 2.10. It says, For we are God's handiwork, his masterpiece, creating Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. See, Paul is saying that this grace from God is so big that we can't contain it. That when we experience this grace of God, it should flow into us in such a way that it flows out to other people around us. We become agents of God's grace in this work, going and doing good work in this world, not because good works can earn us entrance into heaven, but because of the grace that God has given to us. See, through grace, we become agents of grace. In fact, uh, next week, Chris is going to be talking about spiritual gifts. Now, anybody remember what the Greek word for grace is? Charis. And the Greek word for spiritual gifts is charisma. Charisma. All right? And it's this idea that God has not only filled us and forgiven us with his grace, but he has also equipped us to go and be the people of grace in this world. All right? So, come back next week. Listen to Chris. But here is my prayer for you today. I pray that you may recognize that like Paul, like me, you're the worst of all sinners. That by your actions, you deserve the wrath of God. But I also pray that you recognize grace for what it is, that you stop denying it, that you stop abusing it, that you stop trying to earn it, and instead you just embrace it. And that when you embrace grace, that that grace fills you in such a way that the people around you, they can't help but feel it. They can't help but see God in the midst of your life. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we are so blessed to be called yours. I, I, I'm just amazed every single time I get to talk about grace. Well, I just, I don't, I don't understand it. I don't understand your great love. I, it just breaks through every system in our world. It breaks through every merit-based um, way of thinking that I have in my head. And I'm just grateful, Father, because I realize that without that grace, there would be, there would be no eternity in heaven with you. There would be... Oh, so, Father, I just, I just ask that you shape our hearts to help us to recognize that we are in deep need of your grace, Father, that we stop trying to use our own paths instead, just embrace it in the way that you desire us to, and that as a result, as a result, this church community can go forth and be people of grace in the world around us. I ask that you help Hernando County the rest of the world to see the love of your followers. We do such a bad job of this, Father. We choose to 
to judge. We choose to respond in, in ways that are earthly, you know, that ways of hatred, ways of violence, and, and, and I just ask that you change us, Father. In this room are people who, who are gossipers. In this room, there are people who have chosen the path of adultery. There are people who have been in prison. There are people who have been addicted. And Father, I ask that you help us to recognize that every single one of us not only is in need of your grace, but that that grace is extended to us no matter where we've come from, no matter what we've done, so thank you, Father. Thank you. I ask all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.